Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm going to finish the Radio Shack speaker rebuild that I've been working on. In the last video, I completed the repairs I felt were necessary to restore the original performance of these speakers. Today I will test the speakers after the repairs and compare the results with the performance before the repairs. So why don't you join me as we complete the testing of these Radio Shack speakers? I'd like to spend a moment on safety. There's nothing more important than keeping you and your loved ones safe. Be sure to read, understand, and follow the safety rules for your tools. Using your tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And always use the appropriate eye, hearing, and respiratory personal protective equipment. In this video, the main concern is audio. Watch for excessive volume. If you let it get away from you, some of the tests could cause hearing discomfort and possible hearing damage. Now let's get started. In the last video, we repaired the punched in dust cover on one of the tweeters, restored the gasket around the woofer, and replaced the old electrolytic capacitor in the speaker crossover. Old electrolytic capacitors often leak or dry out, which results in a change of capacitance or an increase in the leakage. The result is that the high pass filter breakpoint frequency can change. This can result in the frequency response curve not being as flat as designed. When I opened up the speaker, I was surprised that the crossover network was so simple. I thought it would have a low pass filter for the woofer and a high pass filter for the tweeters. The two-way crossover network in these Nova 7B speakers does include a high-pass filter for the tweeters, but the woofer is simply connected across the speaker terminals. So I decided to dive into the circuit to figure out how this arrangement could work. A low-pass filter is often made by using an inductor in series with the output device. The inductor blocks high frequencies and allows low frequencies to pass. An inductor is often just a coil of wire wrapped very tightly. So is the voice coil of a speaker driver. Could the voice coil of the woofer act as the inductor for the low pass filter? I wasn't sure, so I decided to measure a woofer speaker to find out. Unfortunately, I had already buttoned up the Radio Shack speakers I was working on and they were hundreds of miles away. So I measured a few other speakers and found that speaker drivers do have a fairly significant inductance. Then I used the Falstad circuit simulation application to model the speaker drivers and crossover network. I'll put a link in the description. Using the measurement information and the simulation application to levelize the total speaker power consumption, I backed into a woofer inductance of around 1.2 millihenries and the tweeter inductance of about 0.2 millihenries. A slow motion of the simulation is very useful in demonstrating exactly how a crossover works. In this display, the three graphs at the bottom represent the electrical power of the woofer, tweeter, and amplifier. At low frequencies, the power to the woofer is at the maximum, and the power to the tweeter is almost zero. As the frequency increases, the power to the woofer starts to decline while the power to the tweeter begins to increase. All the while, the power from the amplifier stays relatively constant. Then at the breakpoint, the power to the woofer and tweeters is approximately equal. Above the breakpoint frequency, the tweeter power approaches maximum while the woofer power goes to zero. Sharp-eyed viewers will notice that the frequency breakpoint is not as noticeable on this graph as it has been on the other frequency response curves we've been working with. That's because the power in this simulation is displayed as linear watts versus the logarithmic decibel scale for the other curves. We can predict the frequency breakpoints for both the woofer and tweeters using this simulation. The breakpoint frequency is the frequency that represents one half of the bandpass power. I ran a frequency sweep simulation from 100 to 20,000 Hz and determined the peak power for both the woofer and tweeters. The breakpoint frequency occurs at half of the peak power 
in this case approximately 6.2 watts for both the woofer and the tweeter. Using the cursor, I find the times in the simulation where the power through the woofer and tweeters was 6.2 watts. Then I rerun the simulation, stopping at those times to record the frequencies. For this run, using the design value of 15 microfarads for the crossover capacitor, design breakpoint frequencies were 1.1 kHz for the woofer and 1.2 kHz for the tweeter. This simulation is an idealized representation and doesn't include variables like electrical and acoustical resonance, speaker cone mass, speaker imperfections, phase angle, and room acoustics. But this representation should allow us to predict the change in speaker frequency response as a result of replacing the capacitor in the crossover network. Before I installed the new capacitors in the crossover in the last video, I checked their value and they were very close to the design value of 15 microfarads. Let's check the value of the old capacitor I removed. Hmm, 17 microfarads. That's not as bad as I thought it would be. Well, let's run a simulation using the value of 17 microfarads. The breakpoint of the woofer stayed unchanged at 1.1 kHz, but the breakpoint of the tweeter decreased by approximately 200 Hz to 1 kHz. However, when looking at the amplifier power, the shapes of the frequency response curve look similar, and the peak power increased by only 0.1 watts for the 17 microfarad capacitor. Based on this simulation, I don't think changing the capacitors made that big of a difference in the frequency performance of the speakers. To verify this prediction, let's test the modified speaker. As a reminder, I am using an awesome program called Room Equalization Wizard. I'll put a link in the description. I put the speaker in exactly the same location as when I tested it before the modifications. I also put the same microphone in the same spots and I set the amplifier to the same settings. Then I ran the same series of tests and averaged the results of three separate runs for each configuration. Finally, I smoothed the curve to get rid of the noise so we can concentrate on any significant changes. First, let's look at a comparison between the woofer, tweeter, and overall speaker performance for the modified speaker. As you can see, the tweeter creates a lower sound power level than the woofer at lower frequencies. It looks like the crossover between the two is between 1 and 3 kHz. This is similar to our simulation. Next, let's look at the before versus after modifications curves for the tweeter. Here there is only a slight difference, which agrees with the simulation. As expected, the modifications didn't change the frequency response for the woofer at all. The before and after curves are nearly identical. Finally, the combined frequency response curves shows a slight improvement in the response around 1 kHz. This again was predicted by the simulation. One of the things that affects the actual performance tests is that I'm using a low quality microphone. It looks like the microphone performance drops off significantly above 3000 Hz. This speaker includes some switchable resistors to attenuate the tweeters if needed to match the room environment. However, the attenuation takes place at a frequency much higher than the cutoff frequency of the microphone. I did do a comparison, but the results were almost identical, so I was unable to determine what effect those attenuating resistors had. Thanks for joining me today. I tested the performance of the Radio Shack speakers after I made modifications. We found out the speakers were in very good shape before I started, both physically and electrically. We used a simulation application to predict changes in the frequency response as a result of the crossover modifications. Finally, we are able to verify the predicted changes by running actual frequency response tests. I had a good time working on these speakers, even though the modifications that I made only tweaked the performance a little. I hope you enjoyed watching and learning a little about speaker systems. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. 
If not, give it a thumbs down and leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon!